the show. It's a pleasure being here. And um, we, um, I wanted to share with you um, a patient that's gone through our site, and I think it illustrates um, many of the points uh, that were highlighted today, um, how to transfer the UDP process to the extramural world, um, the goals of, of the broader UDN. And hopefully it's a fruitful case for discussion. Um, first, let me acknowledge uh, there is a team of over 25 individuals, but specific for this case, Joe Markery, who's our uh, lead coordinator, Shwedadar, who's our lead adult medical geneticist, Ashuk Balasubramaniam, who's our uh, internal medicine lead, uh, and also uh, endocrinology, and then Mahin Jain and Lindsay Verich, who are uh, physician scientists who lead our clinical site analysis pipeline, which was also very important uh, in this case. So um, let me underline uh, sort of uh, the approach to patients. The aim at Baylor, which is uh, different from site to site, is to uh, try to uh, use clinical resources as much as possible uh, prior to using research funds to help as many patients as possible. And then there, there's variability, as we discussed in the setting up of the UDN. Some, some sites are not um, using this model and using primarily research funds. And primarily what I mean is that we use a hybrid billing model um, using clinically indicated tests billed first to insurance uh, and then research evaluations covered um, by the grant. Um, and we use a nonprofit third source to try to cover um, uh, and overcome challenges of coinsurance when that becomes an issue. As many of you know, that can be a problem even in clinically indicated tests that are covered by insurance. Um, so our mix of patients reflect the, the whole uh, payer landscape. We have privately insured patients, we have publicly insured patients, and obviously we have uninsured patients. Um, this research subject, which I will discuss, is part of our soft, soft launch, uh, and so this is a local patient, um, and the history was reviewed prior to the UDN opening for applications, um, and then obviously subsequently went through the gateway. Um, we uh, did the uh, 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 pre-evaluation sequencing. Um, this was uh, uh, in-person consent during the visit of the proband. We obtained phone consent from the father. Uh, the mother was deceased and unavailable. Because of the nature of the phenotype, as you saw, we decided to do um, whole genome sequencing in this case, primarily because of the potential to pick up um, structural and copy number variations uh, in the genomic data. And this was sent two, two and a half weeks prior to the clinical evaluation. This was sent to Hudson Alpha. Um, the data was received uh, in, in a timely fashion with about a four-week uh, turnaround time, and uh, the patient was publicly insured, so um, obviously there are challenges with regards to getting genetic testing in that context. So um, there was a pre-UDN evaluation when this patient was seen in genetics clinic, and uh, the individual was an adult in this case. Uh, it's a 30-year-old West African male referred for evaluation of Kleinfelter syndrome. And, um, the clinical history uh, was where the patient was first seen in the primary care clinic um, and where he was reported with a known diagnosis of Klinefelter at approximately age 16 years uh, old. And currently, um, uh, he reports being sexually active with re reduced libido but no problems with ejaculation. And um, genetic testing of a carry type was unavailable at the time. Um, and uh, he had um, endocrine, baseline endocrine evaluation, which showed that follicle-stimulating st hormone and luteinizing hormone were high, while testosterone levels were low. So in terms of the past medical history, um, at 16 years of age, which brought the Kleinfelter diagnosis to the forefront initially, he was found to have undescended testes and small testes, and a serum testosterone was found to be low, and he was started on supplementation empirically, and he was um, on and off this until age 24 years. Um, he uh, did have uh, uh, pubic hair um, and facial and chest hair, and he started shaving around 18 to 19 uh, years of age. And on physical exam, um, he was of normal stature. Uh, he had a BMI of 32. Otherwise, um, uh, testes were present bilaterally, um, and the GU exam was otherwise um, normal. So uh, there was no evidence of an underlying uh, genetic syndrome that was a, a, dysmorphic, a dys dysmorphology on the ex uh, evaluation. This is, this is the pedigree. In red is our individual when he was initially seen on the pre-UDN workup. And um, of note, um, 
on the paternal side of the family, the ethnicity uh, and origins from Nigeria, and African American on the maternal side of the family, and this will be relevant in some of the genomic uh, uh, informatics analysis that we did. Unfortunately, the mother uh, passed away and was unavailable uh, for this um, analysis. So um, the clinical workup that was available uh, to us when we evaluated the case was that he did have a karyotype, and it was 46XX, was repeated and confirmed. Uh, there was fish for SRY, um, and this was negative, and he had a CMA, uh, which did not show any copy number variations that was suggested to be involved in the phenotype, chromosome microarray. Um, he happened to be vitamin D deficient. He had a semen analysis, which showed that he was azospermic. And on imaging, he had a DEXA scan, which showed that he was osteopenic. Uh, a pelvic ultrasound was normal, and abdominal ultrasound did not show any evidence of uh, intra-abdominal gonads or any residual malarian structures. So um, he did have an opportunity for repeat endocrine evaluation, and again, the FSH and the LH were both elevated and the testosterone was again low. So the impression uh, on the review was that this was a classic form of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, he was SRY negative on fish, but there was a question of whether maybe he had gonadomosaicism for SRY. Uh, there was a question of eventually he might need a fish carried out on testicular biopsy, SRY being the master uh, gene for uh, male sex differentiation. Um, we also thought about the possibility of mutation of genes downstream of SRY, uh, in, in, if in fact this were an uh, SRY negative form of, of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, you can have loss of function of DAX1, you can have alterations in SOX9, which is immediately downstream of SRY. This is part of the rationale for um, getting whole genome uh, sequencing, as it's well known that there's a very large multi-megabase regulatory region for SOX9. And then there's this hypothesized Z gene, which is a repressor of the male pathway. Um, a way of explaining exactly this situation, XX males who are SRY negative, thought to be due to mutation of some type of repressor. Um, and so for these reasons, um, we really thought this was an interesting case as a potential of identifying first a novel physiology or a mechanism uh, in a situation where you were, you had non-syndromic form of 46XX sex reversal. Um, just as a quick physiology reminder, um, the LH and FSH were, was upregulated, and this is, of course, the hypergonadotropic component of the hypogonadism, which we had evidence of low testosterone, and clinically he had evidence of, of low testosterone and, and the, the functions related to testosterone. We didn't know at the time what the status of Sertoli cell function was. So it was proposed to the UDN. Uh, as I said, this was a case of a 46XX male, uh, which occurs in the population, but the majority are, in fact, SRY positive, um, uh, often due to a translocation or, or residual of this gene, which then stimulates the male sex differentiation pattern in an in a otherwise female karyotype. Um, so he was accepted based on, A, he had the objective finding, um, B, there was a potential for identifying a rare molecular pathology to elucidate on some downstream mechanistic process, process of sex de determination, and so that was the basis of the uh, acceptance. And so the UDN evaluation was performed primarily um, in the outpatient setting, and so at Baylor, uh, we've tried to do almost all of our evaluations uh, in the outpatient settings in terms of um, uh, many of these uh, individuals. And he first received endocrine testing at the, at the evaluation um, to evaluate um, uh, uh, Sertoli cell function. Um, he received inhibin B me measurements. He received sex hormone binding globulin measurements. He also received an HCG stimulation test to assess latex cell function. And then we also assess adrenal function with glucocorticoids and, and androgens. Um, he also had a measurement of anti-malarian hormone. Imaging included MRI of the brain to assess centrally whether there was a, a pituitary issue, and then um, CT of the abdomen to evaluate uh, at a higher resolution um, any residual malarian structures um, that may have occurred. 
And um, we also did um, peripheral blood PCR for S well, SRY to try to obtain a higher resolution uh, assay for SRY. Um, we obtained a biopsy uh, for skin fibroblasts. At Baylor, we've added to our protocol um, whole blood for RNA-seq um, for the potential of um, really to assess the role of this technology not only in um, um, determining the underlying genetic defect but also potentially understanding mechanistically in the context where um, um, that may be useful. And then as I said, in this situation we requested whole genome sequencing because of the potential for non-coding variant or copy number or structural alterations upstream of SOX9. As I mentioned, it's well been established in the sex differentiation literature that SRY drives SOX9 in this important process. So here is the result of the UDM workup. The anti-malarian hormone was in fact low, um, though we think that at least during development, given the absence of malarian structures, that there was a time period where there was anti-malarian hormone. Inhibin B uh, was low. Uh, but basically, the rest of the uh, endocrine workup, uh, looking at adrenal function, uh, was uh, basically normal. And so um, this was uh, sort of the outcome of the um, uh, workup. During, uh, for the um, beta HCG stimulation, we found that basically, um, again, latex cell function was um, deficient here. Uh, after stimulation. So you can see after uh, stimulation, you see elevated HCG, given that we gave it exogenously, and in spite of this, testosterone was low, um, while um, uh, androstenedione was um, low normal. Uh, the SRY peripheral blood PCR was negative. The MRI of the brain was unremarkable. Pituitary was normal. CT of the abdomen clearly showed absence of any malarian structures. And um, at that time, um, the whole blood RNA-seq was pending. We do ha have the initial analysis of it, which we could talk about. It's actually quite interesting. Um, so in terms of the post-UDN visit summary, we had a 30-year-old, 46XX male, bilaterally small testes and azospermia, no evidence of malarian structures, uh, and um, by all uh, technologies, uh, SRY negative. And so the hypothesis molecularly at the time was that there could be potentially a structural change or regulatory variant downstream of SOI that led to uh, autonomous activation of the uh, uh, male sex differentiation. And again, um, um, trying to identify what would be uh, the, one of the first causes of a non-syndromic 46XX sex reversal case. And so um, Mahim Jain and Lindsay Burge led the genomic analysis uh, on the data that was deposited by Hudson Alpha. Um, we received uh, FASTQ and BAM files, and we used the Baylor UDN alignment pipeline. Um, this was a 30x coverage of about uh, 1.3 billion reads mapped to the genome. Uh, the average insert size was about 288 base pairs. Uh, we applied a structure, structural variant analysis combining breakdancer and SV detect. Um, we looked especially for genes, um, tandem duplication of genes that were known to be. Uh, in the male sex differentiation pattern, like SOX9, like regulatory regions upstream of SOX9. Um, there were many um, filtering of a, over 120,000 possible CMDs to about 217 which were manually curated. Um, and uh, what was nice in this case was that we were able to actually correlate the copy number changes uh, in this group with findings that were in this clinical CMA that was done. And so that helped to sort of um, give us some QA with regard to the whole genome sequencing. Um, with regards to single nucleotide variants and indels, um, the virtual exome, which we derived from the data, showed about 11,500 variants um, using our standard filters. So I'm not going to go through all of this uh, analysis, but basically there were no candidate variants on the structural analysis. Uh, and so with regards to um, for example, duplication of SOX9 or, or some, initially we were hoping to find some alteration in the promoter or enhancer regions that regulate SOX9, it was negative. Um, on review of SNVs and about 11,000 uh, uh, such variants in the virtual exome, we found what uh, we now know to, we think, to be the causative variant. So this, we found a um, arginine to tryptophan change in uh, NR5A1, nuclear receptor subfamily 5 group A member 1, 
this was not present in the father who we had was available and was not present in the exact database. And it's very, very well conserved among vertebrates. We'll talk more about this variant in a little bit. Now, keep in mind we did not have the mother, so we were unable to establish that this variant was de novo directly by sequencing. And this is where I think the expansion of the informatic analysis uh, was very, very helpful. Um, we observed in the genome data that, in fact, this variant was phased with a rare intronic variant. Um, and the father was also heterozygous for this rare intronic variant. Now, this rare intronic variant, when we pulled down actually all the data from the 1,000 genomes, um, was present. It wasn't present in the processed data, but when we went back and looked at the unprocessed data, it was, in fact, present. And this was very important in terms of supporting that this was, in fact, a de novo change on informatics analysis. So we took a haplotype analysis strategy. So here is the um, family structure. And here are the different haplotypes, P1, P2 for the maternal, M1, M2 for the mom, P1 and M1 uh, for the affected uh, individual. And what we found that was that, in fact, the P1 haplotype was what carried the mutation based on the phasing of the intronic variant with, with the mutation. Um, and we were able to infer the P2 haplotype directly by sequence analysis because, again, we had the whole genome on these two individuals. Now, by reviewing the 1,000 genomes uh, data, especially for the African population, remember the father is from Nigeria, the mother was uh, African-American uh, uh, from the southwest U.S., um, we were able to basically um, uh, identify the M1 um, uh, uh, haplotypes um, based on the frequencies across these population, again, from the reprocessed 1,000 genome data. Um, we found that the intronic variant which occurred, again, in this case, on the same allele as NR5A mutation, was limited to the P1 haplotype. And so, based on this, we were able to derive that there was very high likelihood that the NR5A1 variant was, in fact, a de novo mutation on the paternal allele. Um, and basically, I'm not going to go through all of this, but by analyzing the uh, allele frequencies in the African-American Southwest population of the P1, MP2, and presumed M1 haplotypes, versus the Nigerian uh, 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 allele frequencies, that led us to this um, conclusion that this was likely a de novo variant on the paternal allele. So um, let me just um, cover then what, what we think is happening and then how this then has actually um, uh, by actually the, the nature of the network led us to, um, I think, clear uh, evidence that this is, in fact, a pathogenic variant. So NR5A1 is a very important um, transcriptional factor that um, occurs at multiple set stages of um, uh, testy development. It can occur, uh, act on SOI, it can uh, especially affect SOX9 uh, in, in cooperation with DAX1, and this balance uh, uh, regulates the, um, the downstream activation of male differentiation uh, target genes. And so we have this point mutation. Um, that uh, is in NR5A1. So it turns out that this exact position, the R92 uh, position, when substituted for um, a glutamine was actually previously reported in a case of 46XY sex reversal, so the other opposite situation. And it's well known that this region of the protein is called the A box, and it is important for stabilizing transcription factor uh, DNA binding. So. Um, the hypothesis is that, in fact, the variant likely affects interaction uh, with its target DNA binding. Now, um, <clears throat> this was where I think the story, I think, really nicely illustrates the power of the network. We presented this uh, at our recent uh, Houston meeting of the UDN network, and in fact, I talked to Eric Villain. Eric, of course, is a, a world leader in sex differentiation about this case, and in fact, he had seen the same variant. Um, R92W uh, in a patient of his, and in fact, another two cases was also currently found in a consortium. Uh, and in fact, these cases were being studied and have been studied and was being ready for report. And so we had this opportunity where we had one allele, one case, and now we have four cases of the exact same mutation, R92W, which basically causes what we think to be um, this uh, non-syndromic 46XX sex reversal. Um, I think the mechanism is 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 still, 
uh, unclear. I, uh, Eric can comment on it. I think that the, there are some in vitro data uh, that the consortium have generated that supports certainly the possibility that, that NR5A1 can um, act in a context dependent function, uh, whether you're in an XY or an XX um, uh, karyotypic background. And that in this situation, one hypothesis is that the mutation is causing um, a derepression of SOX9 primarily because of its function or its action on DAX1. And I think that that's certainly feasible. You know, I think the alternative is whether this variant itself, because it can act at multiple levels, could function in a gain of function fashion directly on SOX9. Um, you know, this is where, again, I think um, the model organism uh, core will be extremely important. It turns out that NR5A1 uh, exists in uh, fruit flies, and um, um, one the approaches that the model organism core is taking is always is asking first whether um, human variant human genes can rescue the deficiency in fruit flies, and if then yes, how does the mutant um, allele uh, operate in fruit flies? So this is one potential option that could be taken. Um, but actually, um, working with uh, John Postwhite and, and, and uh, Monty in the uh, fish core, they're actually going to generate the knock-in of this variant. Part of the reason is that um, in the zebrafish, there are actually two copies of NR5A1, and this has um, uh, sort of diverged uh, the, the um, central versus the um, gonadal functions of NR5A1, allowing actually for an, a unique opportunity to study the variant. And so they're actually pursuing this with regards to <coughs> generating a knock-in model uh, of this. We are at the same time generating the knock-in model for CRISPR-Cas uh, in the mouse to really try to get at this no novel functional aspect of it. So let me end um, by sort of getting back to what the UDN goals are. The first is improve the level of diagnosis and care of undiagnosed disease. And so I think this clearly is a case where the experts coming together, bringing the genomic technologies and the informatics technologies uh, we're able to um, uh, come to a diagnosis uh, for this individual. I think facilitating the research is key. You know, I think one of the big areas that the UDM will be able to deliver on in the future is exactly situations like this, where there are not clear, simple loss of function or gain of function mutations, but these alleles, which are recurrent in the human population, that have an enormous opportunity to teach, about, teach us about um, structure function and thresholds of activity. Remember, this patient does not have any of the other um, uh, uh, syndromic uh, features that you would um, uh, think about when you think about this path pathway. SOX9 is for active in many other tissues. So th th I think this and the downstream studies with regards to fish and mice will be extremely powerful. And then, of course, the collaborative and integrated research community. In fact, we would not have been able to prove this case without finding this out for, uh, with Eric um, as he was working on this case even outside of the UDN and, of course, the greater, greater con consortium of these two other groups with these two other cases. So I think clearly um, that this has been a very nice example of engaging the broader research community. So I will end there and take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Mm -hmm. And so we're pretty close to right on time, so if we just have any quick questions, Judy. Um, I couldn't help noticing he was a monozygotic twin. Is his twin got the no, same? He was not mine as I got not it. Not as I got it. Sorry. Sorry. That line wasn't there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Brendan.